Who will win Super Bowl 50? And who will be able to defeat the Golden State Warriors? Well, to answer your question, alrighty guys, it is Qua Man here today, bringing you another discussion on Cold Sports Talk, as I'll be sharing my thoughts on the upcoming Super Bowl, Super Bowl 50, and I'm also going to be talking about whether or not any NBA team can stop the Golden State Warriors, as I recently saw the Warriors destroying the Dallas Mavericks. So without wasting any more time, let's get straight into this video, and I'm going to start off by giving you my Super Bowl prediction pick. Now... In terms of the Carolina Panthers and the Denver Broncos, there's one thing that I want to start off by saying, and this is talking about the facets of the team. When you look at how the Denver Broncos squeezed out a win against the New England Patriots, they put up a lot of pressure in the middle. And Tom Brady historically has struggled against teams that put a lot of pressure up the middle. So that's one thing that the Denver Broncos did to win. But also consider Tom Brady has had a decimated offensive line throughout the entire year. Has he's, The New England Patriots have constantly made rotations up front to protect Tom Brady. And they have a lot of inexperienced players playing up front. So you're looking at a Broncos team that barely beat a New England Patriots team with a decimated offensive line. And they also did this against one of the more immobile quarterbacks in Tom Brady. Let's compare this with the Carolina Panthers. Cam Newton is arguably the most mobile quarterback in the NFL outside of Russell Wilson. I'll give a slight edge to Wilson because he's shorter and a little bit more shiftier. But when you look at Cam Newton, he's a bigger quarterback. He, he has more power than a Russell Wilson and he can move in the pocket as well as anybody. So the same effect that the Denver Broncos had to defeat the Patriots, they're not going to do the same thing against Cam Newton because Cam Newton can make plays on the run significantly better than both Peyton Manning and a Tom Brady can. So that's one reason why I think, you know, the Carolina Panthers would have an edge in that sense that they can neutralize that ability. The next thing I wanted to talk about is comparing teams. Now, in terms of total offensive packages, the Carolina Panthers were ranked 11th in no Carolina Panthers were ranked second in rushing and 11th overall in terms of team offense. Now, why is this important? Well, the reason why I'm saying this is important is because looking at those two statistics, in addition to the fact that, you know, obviously Greg Olson is a very big target and he's a mismatch for anybody. He's like a little mini Rob Gronkowski. I think that the Carolina Panthers offense is good enough to compete and beat the Denver Broncos because they already have a significantly better offensive team than the Broncos. Considering Peyton Manning has had injuries this year, considering Peyton Manning has not put up the same numbers he's put up, even though he's had a lot of the same receivers. And I'm, t I'm and as I've said before, when the offseason ended, Julius Thomas will be missed. So when you're looking at a better offensive team in the Carolina Panthers, my edge goes to them in that category. Now, the Broncos do have a better defense, but like I said before, their defense will not be able to do the same things on Cam the way they could do for Brady because of Cam Newton specifically. When you're also adding in the fact that the Carolina Panthers have Ted Genn, who used to play for the Dolphins, and he's a great deep threat. Yes, he does suffer from the dropsies. I think they'll have an advantage there. And last but not least, the most important thing of all, I'm going to have to say it, it's Peyton Manning's health. Peyton Manning has had one of his worst years this year as a, as a quarterback, and he was carried by the, Dol the, by the Denver Broncos defense in many, many, many of those games. You're comparing this with a two-pronged attack in the Carolina Panthers who can attack you in both rushing with Stewart, and they can also attack you with the passing game with Cam Newton, Greg Olson, and... Uh, Ted Ginn, in addition to the fact that the Carolina Panthers are doing this without a Kelvin Benjamin. That's saying that they're not as reliant on their receiving core as you would think. And last but not least, when you consider the fact that the Carolina Panthers have Josh Norman, a Pro Bowl cornerback who will be able to put a ton of pressure on Demarius Thomas, that is telling me that the Carolina Panthers are a significantly better all-around team. Peyton Manning is not. Peyton Manning's options to throw are going to be limited because of Josh Norman. And when you also look at the fact that the Broncos defense, in my opinion, is going to struggle to beat a two-pronged offensive attack in the Carolina Panthers, who in many ways had a more balanced attack offensively than the New England Patriots, 
I'm going to have to give this edge to the Carolina Panthers. And last but not least, as I've said last but not least a hundred times, Cam Newton as a mobile quarterback is able to also make plays on the run in addition to throwing on the run. And he's also a big target who can see over the offensive line significantly better than a Russell Wilson. So with all of that said, guys, I personally just think that the Carolina Panthers are a better all-around football team. I think the Broncos can win it, but I think that it's just going to ask too much pressure on a Peyton Manning who's older to basically squeeze out a win against a significantly favored younger Carolina Panthers team and that's my Super Bowl pick I'm very curious to hear your thoughts in the comment section below those are my reasons and I want to hear what you guys think however as we move on to the NBA let's go so in terms of basketball do I think any team is going to be able to defeat the Golden State Warriors my answer to this is no now, why am I saying this? It's not just because of Steph Curry. It's not because of Klay Thompson. It's not because of Draymond Green. It's not because Steve Kerr is a very good coach and Luke Walton did a great job, you know, subbing in for Luke Walton. It's not the coaching. It's not the players. And it's not the fan base that basically makes them virtually undefe virtually impossible to defeat at home. It's because of the fact that the Golden State Warriors have made the toughest teams in the NBA look like a joke. And I understand that we are just in the regular season. And I understand the playoff changes. Things slow down. Teams put significantly more effort on defense in the playoffs as opposed to the regular season. I understand all of this. But the Golden State Warriors are one of those teams that gets up for playing high competition. And if you look at the two biggest teams that they faced this year, Cleveland... And they've also faced San Antonio. Now, the first time they beat, they played Cleveland on Christmas Day, they beat them. I understand that that was a close game. But that was also, you know, without the assistance of Kyrie Irving, if I remember correctly. So Cleveland was not at 100%, but they held their own with them. You look at what they did the next time with Kyrie Irving in better shape this time. You're looking at a Golden State Warriors team that completely trounced Cleveland in their house. And then when you look at the fact that San Antonio came in, everybody was saying San Antonio, you know, big sports, you know, writers were saying, oh, San Antonio is Golden State's kryptonite because they could neutralize Curry on the perimeter. That didn't happen. They tried to put Kawhi Leonard on Steph Curry, didn't work. And if you look at the Golden State Warriors, from everything I'm saying, you got to look at how deep their team is. I mean... They have three players on their roster that could be franchise players. Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond Green could all be stars of franchises. And you also look at Iguodala, who was arguably the star of Philadelphia when he was younger. Although he wasn't the biggest star in the league, he was arguably the team's best player. Not in the days of Iverson, but when Iverson had retired, you know, Iguodala was a big piece in Philadelphia. You look at, you know, Iguodala, who's now the reigning finals MVP excellent defensive player, very athletic, still, you know, fresh for his age because Walton and Steve Kerr have limited his minutes. You're looking at a younger, fresher Golden State Warriors team from top to bottom who could also play big and small, putting in Bogut to neutralize opposing bigs. And they could also play small, which is basically their secret weapon in basically moving very, very, very fast, getting the mobile advantage against a lot of teams and shooting the hell out of the basketball. It's extremely entertaining to watch Golden State play with small ball. And if you're looking at that, considering Harrison Barnes is now coming back and now he's healthy again, something that wasn't taking place before. And Harrison Barnes is a very underrated piece in terms of the Golden State Warriors scheme because he also helps them play small ball looking at that in addition to Sean Livingston who's like a 6'8 point guard you're looking at a team that has size that can play small that can play big that can shoot that can defend they are such a complete basketball team and people also underrate Steph Curry and Klay Thompson's ability to attack the basket because we just look at them as the Splash Brothers who can shoot, but they can also attack the basket too. And Draymond Green is the ultimate playmaker who can literally make plays for so many of his teammates playing big, playing small. I'm going to have to say that the Golden State Warriors, in my opinion, are just too good. And I think even if they don't break the Bulls and their 72-win record, 
I'm looking at a legendary team in the making. And unless a big major injury takes place, I'm just factoring it healthy. I don't think any team could beat the Golden State Warriors. I'm saying that for my heat. We got our butts kicked by them. I'm saying that for the, the Oklahoma City Thunder, who were way too reliant on isolation plays from Westbrook and Kevin Durant. I'm saying this. You know, in terms of the Spurs, who they keep getting older every year, I'm not going to use age as an example, but I just think that the Warriors are just deeper all around than the Spurs. And if there is one team that could beat the Warriors, I'm going to give the advantage to the Spurs. And I hate to say this for the East, the East, but I'm going to tell you this right now. I don't think any team that comes out of the Eastern Conference can beat either the Spurs, the Thunder, or... Or the Golden State Warriors. That's my pick. I probably would have put Houston in there too if they were playing better. The Clippers, I'm not going to say that for them. But I don't think any Eastern team could beat the Clippers. No, I'm sorry. I don't think any Eastern team could beat the Warriors, the Spurs, and the Thunder. I'll say that one more time. No Eastern team could beat those three teams. And that basically concludes my video for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Please share your thoughts in the comment section below. I'm really, really curious to hear your thoughts, guys. And also, because this is a sports video, it's not going to get that many views, which means I will be able to see your comment significantly better as opposed to if it was a Dragon Ball video. So feel free to comment. I love having sports discussion with you guys, and I hope you guys enjoy this episode of cold sports talk and i'll be back for the future so most importantly over everything else please remember to rate comment and subscribe and remember as i always say to have a great day guys and stay tuned for my q a which will be uploaded shortly later on today